we are going to talk about redox, precipitation, and complexometric titration. Redox titration. What is a redox titration? Redox titration is a laboratory method of determining the concentration of a given analyte by causing a redox reaction between the titrant and the analyte. These types of titrations sometimes require the use of potentiometric or a redox indicator. Redox titration is based on an oxidation-reduction reaction between the titrant and the analyte. It is one of the most common laboratory methods to identify the concentration of unknown analytes. So we are going to talk about reduction and oxidation. So what is a reduction? A substance can undergo reduction and can occur via the addition of hydrogen, the removal of oxygen, the acceptance of electron, a reduction in an overall oxidation state. So what is oxidation? The following points describe a substance that has undergone oxidation. The addition of oxygen, removal of hydrogen, which was attached to the species, the donation or loss of electron, an increase in the oxidation state exhibited by the substance. Thus, it can be understood that redox titrations involve a transfer of electrons between the given analyte and the titrant. An example of a redox titration is the treatment of an iodine solution with a reducing agent. So this is an example of our oxidation reduction titration. Okay, so if you have the known concentration of our um, permanganate inside the burette and then we have the known volume of our solution inside the conical flask we then titrate the um, solutions with our permanganate so that we can determine the unknown concentration of our iron 2 plus below we will see an example of the reaction so if you have a purple permanganate and then we have a colorless um, solution inside the conical flask if you are going to begin the titration we will observe a reduction in our permanganate solution inside the burette so from colorless since our solution inside the conical flask is colorless after the excess drop of our permanganate inside the burette we will observe a purple color um, solution Okay, so let us go back. So if we have the permanganate inside the burette and the known volume of our solution inside the conical flask, after being titrated, we will observe the endpoint that is colored purple solution. Okay, so below is the reaction of our um redox titration so if we have permanganate and then we will have to determine the unknown concentration of our iron 2 plus so we have fe2 plus and then we have the hydrogen that is um, 8 so if you are going to titrate that one we will observe a reduction in our manganese okay so if we have this one Below, you will see we have the redox reaction in our permanganate, okay? So, we have oxygen with negative 2 and then we have 4 below. So, what we are going to do is to multiply this one. So, negative 2 times 4, we have negative 8. But since we have to get a negative 1, what we are going to do is we have to determine the oxidation state of our manganese so this is positive 7 okay so positive 7 minus negative 8 is equal to negative 1 okay so if you can observe at your right from permanganate it then produced in our redox reaction it becomes manganese only okay so we have manganese 2 plus and then if you can observe with our iron 2 plus from 
2 plus the iron is oxidized in our redox reaction. So, it becomes three, uh, 3 plus. Okay? So, from 2 plus, it then becomes 3 plus. Okay? So, again, the iron is oxidized in our redox reaction. If manganese is reduced in our redox reaction, then our iron is oxidized in our redox reaction. So, that is how we are going to determine the redox titration. Okay? So, in our redox titration, it involves the iodometry and iodimetry. So, what are the differences between these two? So, we have iodometry, the quantitative analysis of the solution of an oxidizing agent by adding an iodide that reacts to form iodine which is then titrated. So for our iodimetry, a volumetric analysis involving either titration with a standard solution of iodine or the release by a substance under examination of iodine in soluble form so that we can determine its concentration by titration. So the principle between the two, we have iodometry, iodides react with another oxidizing agent in an acidic medium or neutral medium, while iodimetry uses free iodine to undergo titration with a reducing agent. Nature of the method for iodimetry, we have direct method. So for iodimetry, uh, by the way, that is iodimetry. So for iodimetry, we have an indirect method. Application for iodimetry, we have to quantify oxidizing agents. For iodimetry, we have to quantify reducing agents. So we have here the precipitation titration. So what is the precipitation titration? So by definition, it is a titrometric method which involves the formation of precipitates during the experiment of titration. So the titrant reacts with the analyte and forms an insoluble substance in which we call as precipitate. So the titration is continued till the last drop of the analyte is consumed. When the titrant is excess, it reacts with the indicator and signals to terminate the titration process. Now we have the principles of precipitation titrations. Principles of solubility products and sparing the soluble salts. Precipitation is a combination of two ionic species to form a non-soluble product which forms a precipitate. Okay, so below you will see an example of the reaction. So you have B cation plus A and ion with a product. B and A. So that is your solubility product. So a solubility product is the concentration of our B cat ion plus the A and ion. Okay? So the solubility product permits the cal calculation of an ion if the other is known. So we have the common ion effect. So it is true that addition of ions decreases the solubility. So refer to the picture at your right. We have when a strong base supplies the common ion OH negative, the equilibrium shifts to form more NH. Okay, so when you're adding more OH, which is your ion, to the product, then it will shift to your left or the equilibrium shifts to your left forming more NH3. Okay, so it decreases the solubility. Effect of pH, decrease in pH causing increase in solubility. Effect of the temperature, when you increase the temperature, it also increases the solubility. But the effect of solvent, when adding more solvent, it decreases the solubility. We have titrants and the indicators used. So we are going to form a colored precipitate. So if we have a re reagent with the addition of ion, it will form a precipitate. So what is a reagent? Reagents trigger chemical reactions. So below you will see an example of what I am talking about. Okay, so if you have A plus B 
is equal to C. So we have C as your product. We will determine the reaction based on A and B. Okay. So if your A is the reagent in excess, then your B is the limiting reagent. We will determine the final reaction in letter C. Okay. So if the limiting reagent is already consumed, then the reaction stops, okay? That's how you're going to determine the reaction after limiting reagent is consumed. Since it is the limiting reagent, then the reagent in excess cannot anymore react because the limiting reagent, which is your B, is already consumed. So that's why we have to stop the reaction. So, for example, at your right, you have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 hot dogs, and then you have 4 buns, okay? So, for 1 bun, you have 1 hot dog. But since your limiting reagent is your buns, we only have 4 buns, but the excess is 5, okay? So, if you're going to put the hot dogs to its bun, then we have an excess of 1. That's why we are going to determine the reaction. So, if the limiting reagent is being consumed, then we can now determine the final reaction. Okay, that is how you're going to define the So, in the formation of a colored precipitates, we have again the reagent plus the addition of ions. It will form a precipitate. So, at the end of the titration, precipitates and the indicator ion forms a colored precipitates. So, in the two previous slides, we have been talking about Morse method, okay? So, Morse method is a direct titration using standard solution of silver nitrate in a neutral medium. So, chloride is titrated with our silver nitrate solution and a soluble chromate salt is added as an indicator. This produces a yellow color solution. So when a precipitation of the chloride is complete, you have a reaction which is our um, NaCl plus our silver nitrate. We will it will react together to form AgCl and NaNO3. So at the end point, the first excess of our silver reacts with the indicator to to precipitate red silver chromate as a second precipitate after precipitation of all chlorides as a silver chloride. So you have an excess of our silver and then we have the chrom chromate. It will form silver chromate. Okay, which is the red precipitates. So the Morse method must be performed at a pH of about 8. This method is useful in determining the chloride in neutral or unbuffered solutions such as drinking water. Okay, so our chloride, I mean our Morse method is used to determine the chloride and bromides and it is not used in iodide. So next, we have the formation of soluble colored precipitates. So precipitation reagent plus our ion to be analyzed form a precipitate. So at the end point, there will be no analyte. So the precipitation reagent with addition of the indicator forms the colored precipitates. So the slide before this in which the precipitation reagent with the addition of ions to be analyzed that forms a colored precipitate is what we call the Volhard's method. Okay, this method involves the titration of bromides, iodides, and chlorides in an acidic medium. The chloride in the solution is converted to chloride when reacted with excess silver nitrate solution. So the leftover of silver nitrate is estimated against the potassium thiocyanate solution. When all thiocyanate consumes all the silver, the excess of thiocyanate is made to react with an indicator. It gives a red color on reacting with ferric ammonium sulfate indicator and a ferrous thiocyanate complex is formed. So next we have our Fagen's method. So 
since you know already what is a precipitation titration, we have here, it is a combination of ions forming insoluble, com insoluble compounds that is called as precipitates. And the titration, which involves the precipitation reaction, is called the precipitation titration. Okay, so Fajans introduced the adsorption indicator to detect the endpoint of this reaction. Okay, so Fajans introduced type of indicator for precipitation reaction to detect again the endpoint and the equivalence point. So the indicator is adsorbed by the precipitate. So what is adsorption? Okay, so if you know about absorption, we will talk about adsorption. So on at your right, you will see the difference between adsorption and absorption. So just observe the molecules, okay? So the molecules for our absor absorption first is absorbed in the phase, okay? So molecules are drawn into the bulk of the phase. So they are getting inside slowly. But for our adsorption, they are just adhering to the surface of the phase. So they are sticking to the surface. So during the process of adsorption, a change occurs in the indicator, which leads to a substance of different color. They have therefore been termed as adsorption indicators. Okay, so below you will see their endpoint of argent metric titration so this is a type of titration again that is endpoint not endpoint endpoint so adsorption is we are referring to Fajan's method so a red dye attaches to the silver salt of the surface of the analyte precipitate particles so this happens only when the silver ion ag plus is in excess so just after the equivalent point so here we have the three method we have Morse, Fajans and Walhard method okay so we are going to compare this one according to the silver titration method okay so what are the advantages of these methods so advantages in the silver titration it is simple for more and the disadvantages for Morse method alkaline solutions only okay so it is suitable only for alkaline solutions and not suitable for iodide and it requires a blank titration okay so for fagens we have the capability for different ph ranges and selectivity with different indicators for the disadvantages of fagens method difficulty with dilute solutions and should not be a high background ionic level for our volhard's method capable of direct silver and indirect halide analysis Okay, it is very, it has a very clear color change and for the disadvantages, it must be one molar nitric acid solution and some problems with specific anions. Okay, this time we are going to talk about complexometric titrometry. Complexometric titrations are used mainly to determine metal ions by the use of complex forming reaction. Complex are formed only when the central atom, which is the metal ion, accepts the electron pair from one or more ligands. Okay, so what are ligands? These are electron donating species. So based upon the formation of coordination complex is known as complexometric titration. Principle of complexometric titration. Okay, so complexometric titrations are used to titrate and analyze the concentrations of unknown metal ions that are present in the sample solutions. Suppose that you have a solution containing copper ion, but you don't know the concentration of the copper ion in your sample solution. Okay, by applying complexometric titration, 
we will be able to learn the concentration of the copper ion present in your sample solution. So again, we are going to analyze the metal ions present in our solution. Okay, so we will continue with the principles of our complex symmetric titration. Okay, so you have here the reaction between metal indicator complex and when the addition of um, chelating agent is present, we will form metal chelate complex plus indicator. So how does it happen? Okay, so from the um, metal indicator complex, the indicator here binds to metal ions and form complexes. Okay, so with the addition of our chelating agent, it replaces the metal from the metal indicator complex. So in the solution, that is in the solution. So chelating agent always binds strongly with metal cations compared to our indicator. Okay, so since it is stronger compared to our um, indicator or it binds stronger compared to the indicator, it then replaces the indicators from the complex, okay? So after the metal chelate complex, the indicator is now free, okay? So we will form metal chelate complex plus indicator. So at the end of the titration, all the indicators are replaced by chelating agent and produce a color change of the solution. So that is how we detect the endpoint of the titration. So below you will see the definition or the principle also of our um, complexometric titration. We've talked about this one in the previous slide. So here is an example of our complexometric titration. Okay, so first we have the burette containing at the solution. We have colorless solution. So what is EDTA? EDTA is a chemical that binds and holds on the chelates, minerals, and metals such as chromium, iron, lead, mercury, copper, aluminum, nickel, zinc, calcium, cobalt, manganese, and magnesium. So EDTA stands for ethylene diamine tetraacetic acid okay so that is the solution inside the burette so the initial reading we have 50 ml of at the solution in the burette so for the um the solution inside the conical flask we have magnesium sulfate okay so since it contains magnesium which is a metal ion we will have a red color of our um, solution inside the conical flask. So magnesium with the addition of our indicator. So we will have um, red color solution. So as we continue titrating, the volume in our burette decreases. So it then makes 40 ml. So we have still the EDTA solution that is colorless and then from red it changes to blue. So what happens to the indicator? It is then separated because we are adding the chelating agent. Okay, so magnesium at the reaction plus the indicator. So it then turns blue. By the way, the um, structure that you will see below is the EDTA structure or the ethylene diamine tetraacetic acid. So once the color has changed, then we can determine the endpoint of our titration process or our complexometric titration. Okay, here are some examples of our complexometric indicators. Okay, so you know already the concept about complexometric titration. So um, the metal that we are using is magnesium cation and then um, the indicator is aerochrome black T. So if we indicate the volume 1 as the volume of the ETA used, so we have volume of the ETA 50 ml minus 40 ml is equals to 10 ml. So V2 is the volume of magnesium sulfate or the analyte. So this is the analyte that we use to 
determined in the conical flask or the solution inside the conical flask. But what is again the uh, principle of complexometric titration? We are going to determine the concentration of the unknown analyte that is your magnesium ion. So we are to going to talk about the metal ion. So if our analyte is magnesium sulfate, usually it is given so we will have to determine the unknown analyte that is your magnesium ion okay so that is xml and then we have s1 it is the strength of the eta solution so we will um, notify that as y molar okay so if we are going to do the proper calculation usually the molar concentration of our eta is also given. So at your right, you have there um, the metal, we have the indicator, and then what we're looking for is the concentration of the unknown analyte, that is your magnesium ion. So if we have the formula, V1 S1 is equal to V2 S2. So S2 is what we're looking for, that is the unknown analyte magnesium ion. So, if you are going to derive S2 from this formula, we will get this one. V1 times S1 over V2. And then, if you already have the values for this, you are just going to replace the values. So, we have 10 times S1 over V2 molar. Okay, so S2 is blank. Okay, blank molar. That is how you're going to get the unknown analyte.